Hello and welcome to MRA's 5-Minute HR Feed, the podcast where you get quick practical information about a hot topic. In the time it takes to make a cup of coffee, you'll gain insights on hot topics and pressing HR issues. I'm your host, Rebecca Jacobs, and we are so glad you're here. Before we start, here's my usual disclaimer that the podcast is general information only and does not contain any legal advice. Now it's time to dive in. Today, we're talking about two key takeaways from the new harassment guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. First, the EEOC is expanding the blanket as far as it can within the bounds of Title VII, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, to show that certain conduct which may have flown under the radar in the past actually can be harassment on the basis of a protected characteristic. First, there's focus on accommodations. And what are people experiencing in the workplace when they get an accommodation, perhaps for morning sickness under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, or for a condition under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and now their coworkers are upset and teasing them, berating them, giving them a rough time that, that they're getting this special treatment, that conduct can be harassment on the basis of um, the pregnancy accommodation or on the disability accommodation. This guidance highlights the sensitivity and accountability that managers will need in order to maintain a comfortable work environment for their employees with conditions that need to be accommodated. Gender identity is also mentioned. Misgendering by coworkers and or customers can be harassing conduct based on the protected characteristic of gender identity. In another example, the guidance fine tunes the concept of sex stereotyping to focus in particular on any social or cultural expectations, whether positive, negative, or neutral, arising from how someone of a protected group may act. And I quote, this includes harassment based on sex-based assumptions about family responsibilities, suitability for leadership, gender roles, weight and body types, the expression of sexual orientation or gender identity, or being the survivor of gender-based violence. The example given has a supervisor telling a female at work who is the victim of domestic violence not to bring her drama into work and, and other um, similar uh, comments such as, I can't trust you with this important work stuff if you can't even manage your own personal affairs. So the key takeaway from point number one is that if at first blush, something seems to be outside of the scope of harassment laws, take a quick step back and ask whether it implicates something connected to the broader swath of these federal laws. Second, the EEOC has shed light on what is an effective anti-harassment policy procedure and more importantly, response. The key overarching elements are that the employer has a policy against harassment has a process for addressing complaints, trains employees to understand their rights and responsibilities, that includes managers, and monitors the workplace to ensure the policy is being adhered to. So let's let's drill into each one of these to see what are those points that make, what are those factors that make these different things effective. So for policies, they need to define what conduct is prohibited, need to be widely disseminated, they need to be comprehensible to workers. So think about who you have in your workplace who speaks English as a second language or as an English language learner, you may need to have your policy translated to make it available and accessible to those those workers. Your policy needs to require supervisors to report harassment when they're aware, aware of it. This is a key part. This seems to be an underlying focus in this guidance. The policy needs to offer multiple avenues for reporting harassment so that the employees can contact someone other than their harassers. And this is something that HR practitioners routinely look for in, for example, handbook quick checks. Policy needs to clearly identify accessible points of contact to whom those harassment reports should be made and include contact information. That's very important. And then explain the complaint process. And for a complaint process to be effective, it needs to have anti-retaliation and confidentiality protections. And the, the process needs to provide for prompt and effective investigations and corrective action. Now, promptness of your investigation depends on the circumstances, but the more severe the allegation, the faster you want to start. The guidance says, quote, in many instances, what is reasonably soon is fact sensitive and depends on such considerations as the nature and severity of the alleged harassment and the reasons for delay. Another point specifically called out in the guidance is that the alleged harasser should not have any supervisory authority over the person running the investigation. That's something to keep in mind, too. For a training to be effective, it needs to explain the policy and complaint procedure and confidentiality and anti-retaliation protections. You're seeing the theme here. 
It needs to give examples of prohibited conduct under the policy. So flesh it out. You know, mocking someone's accent, um, giving someone a rough time because of their accommodation, um, making fun of the their their meal, things like that um, could be could potentially be um, harassing conduct that we don't want to see at work. And the training also needs to provide information about the employee's rights if they experience, observe, become aware of, or report conduct that they believe may be prohibited. And then we need to provide supervisors and managers with information on how do you prevent, identify, stop, report, and correct harassment. And we need those clear instructions that are telling them you must address and report harassment that you observe or that is reported to you or that you otherwise become aware of. Thinking about the, think about the rumor mill at work too. Your training needs to be tailored to your workforce and your workplace, provided on a regular basis to all employees, and make sure it's clear and easy to understand. So as you can see, there's a big emphasis on should have known in terms of an employer's notice of inappropriate conduct. EEOC wants a harassment policies to require managers and supervisors to report those observed instances of harassment. They'll need good training on how to spot harassing behavior and how to report it even if it seems like everyone is having a good laugh. Thank you for listening to MRA's 5-Minute HR Feed. For this episode, be sure to reference the show notes where you can sign up to connect for more podcast updates. If you have questions, you can connect with MRA's hotline team by emailing info now at mranet.org or calling 866-474-6854. Check out other MRA episodes on your favorite podcast platform, such as MRA's 30-Minute Thrive. And as always, make sure to follow so you don't miss out. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll have another hot HR topic in two weeks.